Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. Welcome back to Basketball History 101. This is Rick Loiza, and I'm here in studio with my editor and producer, Jacob Loiza. Hey, Dad. How are you doing? Doing good. Doing good, son. Uh, it's been a while since we did one of these cold opens. Yeah, I've, I've really missed doing this. Uh, it's, good, it's good to be back here. Yeah, well, yeah. Good to have you in studio with me. Uh, so today's episode is about Allen Iverson's crossover. That's right. So just this one crossover is worth an entire episode of Basketball History 101. It's it's iconic, and I and I get into that into the episode. But this is one of the, in my opinion, one of the most iconic moves in basketball history. Uh, his crossover was one of the quickest and most deadly and most successful crossovers to get himself open for a jump shot. So what what drew you to the story? The thing that drew me to the story, and again, I'll talk. I'll get into more detail into how this happened in the episode. But what drew me to the story is the fact that somebody taught him the crossover. And when I found that out, I thought, oh, I've got to do an episode on that. So it wasn't his particular crossover. was not one that he developed himself. He learned it from somebody else. One of his college teammates had that crossover, and he couldn't figure it out. And he wanted to learn it, so he just asked his teammate, hey, teach me your crossover. And then, of course, he took and kind of made it his own, made it, put his Iverson spin on it. And found a lot of success with it in the NBA. So this no-name college player ended up teaching the great Allen Iverson how to perform the most deadly move of his entire career. That's right. That's right. And we're going to talk about him as well. So he never. This this was a um, a backup player on on at Georgetown University where Allen Iverson played. He never made it to the NBA. Never made it into the professional ranks. Uh, he just was a. He was part of the team, but he was a practice player. Hardly ever played in the games. But he did have this crossover that Allen Iverson admired and wanted to learn. So it's kind of a cool story how that all worked out. All right. Well, that sounds really interesting. Let's get into the episode now. All right. Let's do it. This is Basketball History 101. With Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today, we're going to talk about one of the most iconic moves in basketball history, Allen Iverson's Deadly Crossover. If you had to make a list of some of the most iconic moves in basketball history, you would have to include Kareem Abdul-Jabbar skyhook, George Gervin's finger roll, Earl Monroe's spin move, Michael Jordan's fadeaway jump shot, Magic Johnson's no-look passes, LeBron's chase down blocks, and Akeem Olajuwon's dream shake. And those are just the ones I thought of off the top of my head. Now, I'm not saying that these players invented these moves, nor am I saying that these players were the first ones to perform these moves at the NBA level. All I'm saying is that the way that these players made these moves turned them into signature moves, and because of their success, made these moves iconic. But today, we are only going to talk about Iverson's Deadly Crossover. You've seen this move many, many times on ESPN or on YouTube highlights. And I'm sure you've seen the highlight of Iverson using his crossover to beat Michael Jordan to get an open jump shot, which he made. But you probably didn't know where he got the crossover move from. And that story is at the center of today's episode. But first, let me give you a little bit of background on Iverson. 
His story has been told many times, so I'm not going to go into extensive detail here, but more of an overview of his early life. He was born to a 15-year-old single mother named Ann Iverson, and he was raised in Hampton, Virginia. The neighborhood where he grew up was one of the poorest areas in Virginia, and in that environment, young Allen showed a speed and coordination that defied his age. When he was just nine years old, he was playing on a youth American football team. His coach moved him up to play against the 11 and 12 year olds, and he was faster than all of them. By the time he reached his junior year of high school, or third year of secondary school, he was the star quarterback, defensive back, and punt returner for the Bethel High School football team, and led them to the Virginia State Championship. A recruiting analyst by the name of Tom Lemming said that the two best high school quarterbacks in the entire country at that time were Peyton Manning from New Orleans, Louisiana and Allen Iverson from Hampton, Virginia. If he had decided to stick with football, he might have been one of the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history. But Allen Iverson was also the starting point guard for the basketball team at Bethel High School, where he was considered by many to be the best high school player in the entire country. And there is where he pulled off the rare feat of also leading the basketball team to a Virginia State Championship. So there he was, arguably the greatest high school athlete in the country at the high school level. He had scholarship offers for both football and basketball. He could have attended almost any university he wanted, and he preferred football. He said that football is the sport he was better at and enjoyed playing more. That's the direction he was thinking during high school. And then he was arrested and convicted of assault related to a massive brawl in a local bowling alley. So because of this, Iverson was unable to finish his final year of high school at Bethel. After spending some time in confinement, he was pardoned by then governor Douglas Wilder. As part of his pardon agreement, he was not allowed to participate in athletics. Nearly every one of his scholarship offers for both football and basketball had been rescinded, except for one. Hall of Fame basketball coach John Thompson of Georgetown University was still willing to bring Iverson to campus and give him a second chance that no other school was willing to give him. John Thompson had coached Patrick Ewing, Alonzo Mourning, and Dikembe Mutombo, among many other players who played for him before going on to successful NBA careers. And for Iverson, that meant leaving football behind and going with basketball because that is where his only opportunity was. And here at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., is where Iverson would cross paths with that deadly crossover. And this is a good place to stop and take a break. I'll then share the story of how he learned the crossover. So we'll be right back after this. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show. And now let's get into that crossover. Iverson had a teammate by the name of Dean Barry. Dean Barry was a walk-on at Georgetown. Now being a walk-on means that he was not recruited to come to Georgetown to play on the basketball team. He earned his place at the university for his academic accomplishments. But having played on the basketball team at his high school, he wanted to see if he could make it onto the Georgetown squad. Almost every university basketball team holds open tryouts for any student who thinks they might be good enough to earn a spot on the team. Very, very rarely does a school find a diamond in the rough through these tryouts, but it only takes a couple of hours of the coaching staff's time, and basically, you never know. Dean Barry was one of these players. He impressed the coaches enough to be offered a spot on the basketball team. But make no mistake, walk-on players rarely get to play in the games and are most often expected to run the opposing team's offense and defense during practice sessions as a way of preparing the regular starters for the next game. Walk-on players do not get a scholarship. They have to pay tuition and all fees just like any other student. But Dean Barry was a very good student even when it came to basketball. 
He studied the crossover moves of Tim Hardaway, Isaiah Thomas, and John Stockton. And he blended it all together into a crossover move that consistently beat other players, even beating Iverson. And that confounded Iverson. Barry would always put in a little fake to get the defender leaning in the wrong way, and then he would hit him with a crossover and get himself open for a jump shot or a drive to the basket depending on what the rest of the defense was doing. Iverson loved to play Barry one-on-one -on -one after practice because he could not stand the idea of not being able to figure out this crossover. Even when he knew the fake was coming, he could not help but be fooled by it. So finally, Iverson says to Barry, you've got to teach me that crossover. So Barry spent many afternoons with Iverson showing him that crossover move. He would dribble the ball very wide and allow the ball to be away from his body. He would then put his hand on the inside of the ball as if he's going to push the ball out and sideways to get open. Then he would move his upper body ever so slightly in that same direction in order to get the defender to turn his feet. Then he would suddenly glide his hand over the top of the ball to the far side to quickly pull it back and go into the crossover. If the defender took the bait, his feet were facing the wrong way and very suddenly the dribbler is behind the defender with options on where to go next. The dribbler can either drive or simply shoot an open jump shot. It's an absolutely killer move, especially when it's done correctly and with the speed that Iverson brings to it. The best example of this is probably the time that he pulled it off against the mighty Michael Jordan. We all know that Jordan was regarded as the best defender at his position for most of his career. He had cat-like reflexes and was rarely fooled by such fake moves. But when Iverson hit him with that crossover, it made Jordan look like an average player. I mean, the first time I ever saw that particular highlight, I gripped the arms of my chair and snapped my head back because I could not believe what I was seeing. I mean, nobody ever fooled Jordan like that. Iverson made Jordan look human that night, and the image burned itself into my brain. Now, just to make it convenient for you, I'm gonna put a link in the description to the video of that highlight. So go and check it out once you're done listening to this episode. So here we are on March 12th, 1997 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's a Wednesday night. This is a young Iverson. He is still a rookie. His hair is short and he only has a couple of tattoos. When Iverson woke up that morning, he thought to himself, this is the day. He had been waiting for this moment since he first watched Jordan play on television when he was a kid. Iverson had a Michael Jordan poster on the wall of his bedroom back in Hampton, Virginia. And here he is getting ready to suit up for the Philadelphia 76ers. As he steps onto the court that night for the warm-up, he looks over and right across the court is Michael Jordan, his hero. Iverson's goal that day is to cross up Jordan. He even told his coaches that his goal was to cross up Jordan. Rarely do people ever get to meet their heroes. And even more rarely does somebody get to embarrass their hero. As Iverson is bringing the ball up, you can hear Chicago Bulls head coach Phil Jackson yell out, Michael, get up on him. As Iverson approached Jordan, he gave him just the fake to see if Jordan would bite on it. He did. So now Iverson knows the move will work. Then Iverson goes into the move again, giving Jordan the fake for the second time. And Jordan bit on it again. But this time, Iverson hit Jordan with the crossover and got himself open for a jump shot. Iverson rises up and hits it. The crowd in Philadelphia goes wild. They knew that they had just seen a move that will live on forever in highlights. The kid just lived up to his nickname. The answer. And that is the day that that move became iconic. And giving credit where credit is due, we need to remember Dean Barry, the guy that taught Iverson the move. After Barry graduated from Georgetown, he moved into the corporate world and became an executive with a medical supply company in Miami, Florida. But I want to salute Dean Barry and make sure that his place in basketball history is remembered. That crossover is an absolutely deadly move. 
and all of us as basketball fans are better off for it. Well, that's our story for today. Join us next time as we talk about the impact of Gary Vitti. He was the head trainer for the Lakers and won eight championships with the team, going back to the Showtime days with Magic and Kareem and through all five of Kobe's championships. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. Also, go ahead and give us a rating and a review, and that will help others to find this podcast more easily. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. And don't forget to check out sportshistorynetwork.com for more information on my podcast and the rest of the podcasts on our network. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s, Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports, Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.